Good evening, Calvary Chapel Concord. Blessed to be with you tonight just to worship the Lord and find out what He has for us and just draw closer to Him. I wish we could see your face, but we can. So you can come down here if you like. Really, it's okay. And uh, we encourage you to do that as well. But if you're not able to make it, we're blessed to have you on the waves. So let's worship the Lord, you guys. Father, we just love you and praise you. And man, we just look forward to all that you have in store for us, Lord. We know that you know us better than we know ourselves. And Lord, just the things that we're going through, the things that we're struggling with. And Father, especially just you know the word that you gave tonight, the three or four or five short verses that, that Father, you've given to us to look at. But Lord, just the things of faith and and. Lord, the things of trials and, and, and sorrows and, and, and those things that we go through, Lord, just knowing to believe in you and, and that, Lord, you will do what you say and what you promised that you would do. And uh, we need to remember that. And so, Father, open our eyes and our heart and our mind and our very soul, Lord, to all the things that you have for us. And, Lord, just bless us as we worship you. Inhabit the praises of your people as you promised. And Lord, we'll give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, and everyone said. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. You would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Who brings our chaos Back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nation with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I 
Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. is my fall You are the friend that answers my call You are my day You are my night You are my love And all of my
One day when heaven is filled with his praise, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he, wood became flesh and Light shined among us, His glory revealed. Where well, living He loved me, dying He saved me, buried He carried my sins far away. Rising He justified freely forever. One day He's coming, O oh, glorious day, O oh, glorious day. One day they led Him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, spies and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. Hands that healed nations, stretched out on a tree. And took the nail for me. Living, He loved me. Dying, He saved me. Buried, He carried my sins far away. Rising, He justified freely forever. One day, He's coming. Oh, glorious day. Oh, glorious day. Ascended, my Lord, evermore. Death could not hold him, the grave could not keep him from rising again. Rising again, well, living, he loved me, dying, he saved me, buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, He justified freely forever. One day He's coming, oh glorious day. Living, He loved me. Dying, He saved me. Buried, He carried my sins far away. Rising, He justified freely forever. One day he's coming, a oh, glorious day, a oh, glorious day, glorious day, glorious day. It's 
who you are and I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am I've seen many searching for answers far and wide but I for answers only you provide cause you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I It's who I am, it's who I am, cause you're perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways, to us, you are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am, it's who I am. Oceans rise, my 
Let I have done 
I'd worship you as king. To see the morning star, to know how great you are, Lord, I need an undivided If I'm to live in truth and love, to glory. To share the joy, the grace and peace your spirit does in pray you would grant us an undivided heart. Father God, that we would leave behind the distractions of the day and of the world, that we would come and meet you, meet your glory, God, here through your word. We thank you so much for this time that we've had to fellowship with you in your presence, that you've invited into us into the holiest of places, God, and that you've made us white as smoke, snow, so that we might come in and, and enjoy our friendship. Father God, we pray that you would open up your word to us, that we might understand and receive all that you have prepared for us through Pastor Joe. We ask your anointing on him as he teaches, that your word would go out in power and in truth, and we ask that you would um, just be glorified here. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. The guitar sounded great. Don't mess with the dials. <laughs> sounded really good. Hello, church family. How you guys doing? It's nice to have people in front of you. It's nice. Get to see people instead of empty chairs. I would encourage you, those that are listening, in, to come on down. <laughs> it's nice. One thing that's been uh, laid on my heart was um, you've all heard that verse before, uh, Hebrews 10.25, that says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Have you read the verse before it and the rest of the verse? Let me just read that for you. It just, it just really spoke to me this week. Okay, Hebrews 10, 24, it says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. That's the part that got me. It says, as you see the day approaching. 
We've been in the end times since Paul for 2,000 years, but things are getting closer and closer and closer. There is, before, all the things that Jesus spoke about in Matthew and Luke and uh, uh, Mark about, you know, the end times and what's happening, well, now, within the last, say, 100 years, now we see it's global. And that's what the Bible talks about, is that you're going to see it, you're going to see it all over the world, like pandemics, like earthquakes. And it's like birth pangs, and it's going to get more and more and more. And the more things we see like that, we need to get together to help each other, to exhort each other, to call each other to love, to get into the Bibles, to memorize verses and things like that. And um, so those that can, I would encourage you to, Come to church. Come to the fellowship. Anyway, that's what I had to say. <laughs> now, let's get to what the pastor is going to talk about tonight. And that's in uh, Mark chapter 16, verses 12. <laughs> I know, I have it written down. I didn't look at it. 12 to 15. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, after that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at a table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Okay, and as the pastor comes up here, he's going to teach us from the Word and uh, enlighten the words to us. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks, Bob. All right. Let's open your Bibles to uh, Mark chapter 16. We're getting right down to the, to the wire in terms of being almost done. We have it knocked out. So we're going to look at just a few verses tonight. Verses 12, 13, 14, and 15. And uh, it may be a little bit shorter, I don't know, but there's just a lot in here, and I kind of got stuck here, to be honest with you. What we have thus far is the universal question, and... Really what it comes down to is you can be for him or you can be against him, but you cannot be neutral. You cannot be in the middle. You've got to make a decision. And I, I, I noticed that there's some similarities to what we're experiencing in terms of lawlessness, isn't there? Because they chose lawlessness. They chose to go against Christ. And we see that because of it, Jesus is crucified, that he dies. And Isaiah, you know, in verse 53, it gives us a summary Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrow. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. God turns his back on his own son. But this is how Jesus made it possible for us to become right with God. And Jesus then cried out with a loud voice, it is finished. And he breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn in two, signifying reunification between man and God, or a way for men to go to God. And so in these key elements of the gospel, that Jesus was crucified, that he died, that he was buried, his burial proving his death. Why was it important for him to die? It was his death that paid for our sins, first of all. But his death was that sacrifice, paying a debt that we owed to God for our sins. 
But his death is also the primary part. You got a little ringing there, guys. Uh, his death is also the primary part of the resurrection, which is what we're talking about tonight. If he didn't die, then he didn't rise from the dead. His resurrection is the chief thing that proves to us that Jesus is the Savior. His resurrection sets him apart from every other so-called religion. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Back in Mark, when the Sabbath was passed, we see Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, the, they all got together and they brought spices that they might come to anoint Him. They came very early in the morning on the first day of the week. They came to the tomb when the sun had just risen. Thinking on the way, who would roll away the stone from the door of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone was gone. It had been rolled away. And as they entered, they saw the angel with the long white robe. The resurrection, guys, proves the validity of Jesus' sacrifice. It provides, secondly, the ability for us to live in Christ. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. Guess what? He's not here. He's risen. He is risen indeed. See the place where they had laid him. And go tell his disciples, especially Peter, that he's going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him. How reassuring that Jesus isn't finished and isn't done with Peter. That he's got things and work for Peter to do. But then we begin there in the latter part of chapter 16 with the appearances of our Lord. So when he arose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first and foremost to Mary Magdalene. And then she went and told those that had been with them, as they were mourning and as they were weeping, and when they heard that he was alive and that he, Jesus, had been seen by her, what was their reaction? They did not believe. These are the days, the last days of our Lord's ministry on earth. Think about it. We saw him as an innocent man being put on trial. We saw him being condemned to death. We've seen him beaten, crucified, and dying. We've seen him buried. And last week, what happened early in that Sunday morning, a group of women going to the tomb, finding it empty, the angel telling them that Jesus had risen from the dead and that they should go and tell the disciples. But the disciples not believing the woman, but two of them, Peter and John, they get up immediately and they run to the tomb and they find it empty as well. And then later that morning, Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene. When Mary told the disciples, they still didn't believe. Verse 12 picks up and says, after that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. Luke gives us a broader picture, a paintbrush stroke, if you would, in Luke chapter 24. And in Luke 24, verse 13, it says, Now, behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So these two guys just walking down the road, going to a village named Emmaus, the road to Emmaus. And they're just chatting about all these things that had taken place and happened. And so it was, while they conversed and while they reasoned back and forth, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. So the Lord intercepts them on the path that they're taking. And he begins to walk with them. 
perhaps from behind, just listening in. But when they did see him, it says their eyes were restrained so that they didn't know who he was. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk? And you are sad. What, what, what's going on with you guys? Then the one, verse 18, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? Now, that's a soft version. The harsh version might be like, what, are you crazy? Where have you been on the planet Mars? Don't you know what's happened in these past days? But Jesus said, what things? Tell me. And I find it interesting how Jesus handled these guys. For he knew the answer to their question better than they did. And yet, he let them go on and keep talking. Verse 19, so they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, of course, the one who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. And we had our hopes. Indeed, beside all of this, today, it's the third day since these things happened. Yeah, and there were certain women of our company, of our group, who arrived at the tomb early, astonished us when they didn't find his body. And they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angel who said that Jesus was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And then he said to them, Jesus did, Oh Foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And so beginning at Moses and of all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This was the worst it got for many of those who were close to Jesus and who loved him. It's the worst. Because everything they thought was going to happen isn't going to happen. It's like someone put the brakes on, shifted gears, put it in reverse, turned the car around, and everything changed in a moment. Oh, foolish ones. I read this and I think, how many times have things so radically changed in my life? Things have been turned upside down, go in one direction, and all of a sudden, it's halted. It's a shock to the system. And I, as I read this, as, as I was thinking about these things, because this is what the Lord does for us. When we need, when we need that help and that strength, when we need that stabilization in our life, I, I would have loved, as he began at Moses and all the prophets and expanded to them the scriptures. I would have loved, I would still love, <laughs> but to get a, a tape or a CD of that Bible study. You know what I mean? It's like, it would just, to hear Jesus himself explain the Old Testament scriptures would be amazing. 
But the thing I want you to notice tonight is how Jesus deals with their unbelief. What does he do? How does he deal with what they're struggling with? The, the whole idea of, you know, hey, it's, it's never going to be the same. It's, it's not, it's not going to be what we thought it was going to be. It's not going to work out. Everything's ruined now. How does he answer that unbelief? He opens the scriptures. Plain and simple. Guys, when we are encountering all the things that we are encountering with COVID-19 and, you know, all the things with Black Life Matters and all the things with the unrest and, and perhaps even those that would want to destroy our country, you need to go back, you know, to what you do know the things that you do know. You need to go back to the Word of God. And it seems, I'm sure, somewhat simplistic to say that, but it's the truth, guys. To bury yourself, to absorb yourself into the Word of God. And so Jesus comes up and he begins to expound upon the Scriptures. And it says, They drew near to the village where they were going, Emmaus, and he indicated that he would have gone further, but they constrained him. He wanted to keep on going, but they constrained him saying, abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And so he went in to stay with them. Now, it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they knew him. Sometimes all it takes is open eyes to be able to see the problem, the dilemma, the issues at hand, to give you a clear path. Sometimes taking of the bread and the cup helps to take away the fog. Whatever it was, their eyes were opened and they knew him. They knew him. I love that. What does the word do? It allows us to know him. What does knowing him do? It allows us to have that solid foundation to stand upon when it seems like everything is coming unraveled, when everything is falling apart. And as they made this realization, they said to one another, man, did not our heart burn within us while he talked to us on the road? And while he opened up the scriptures to us, did not our heart burn within us? And so they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened to them on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. The breaking of the bread. God revealed himself to them through that. And so Mark tells us how the disciples responded to their story. And then verse 13, back in Mark 16 now. And they went and they told it to the rest. But notice, they did not believe them either. We saw him. We saw him, man. He's right. We got It was amazing. We didn't know at first. We didn't know what was going on, but we saw him. This this is this this pair, this this couple of guys on the road to Emmaus. And yet they looked at him and said, No, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. Reminds me of the parrot on Monty Python skit. It's alive. No, it's not. See it just moved. No. You didn't see him. Yes, I did. We talked to him. You couldn't have, said his followers. Sad thing is that hour after hour, 
Day after day, the disciples remained in a needless state of depression and despondency simply and solely because of unbelief. The danger of unbelief is phenomenal. But they remained in their condition of hopelessness and helplessness because of unbelief. The disciples didn't receive the testimony of the women. But they didn't receive the testimony of these two men either. They were equal opportunity unbelievers, I believe. (laughs) You know what I mean? Verse 14. Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. And he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. Underline that, guys. Hardness of heart. Later, he appeared. Who appeared? Jesus appeared, guys. To the eleven up in the upper room. Balling their eyes out. He appeared to them as they sat at the table as they remorsed, as they went over it again and again in their mind. Peter, you know, we know what his response was. I'm going fishing. They were broken. They were heartbroken. And they sat at the table, but he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. Jesus attributes what the problem is to their unbelief and hardness of heart. Because, all because... They did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. I don't believe you. I saw him with my own eyes. I don't believe you. Why would I lie to you? I don't believe you. He rebuked them. He reprimanded them. Upbraided them, it says, for their denying. <clears throat> he reprimanded them for their running, for their fear. He reprimanded them for one thing only, not for those things. It wasn't for them running away. It wasn't for their fear. It wasn't for their denying him. It wasn't for any of those things. The one thing he reprimands them for is their unbelief. But then, as only our Lord can, he quickly moves on. But I want you to understand this here. And and let's look at it a little bit deeper. He rebuked on a diesel. Means to reproach, to upbraid, to revile. There's several Greek words used in the New Testament that are translated as rebuke. This particular word is used ten times in the New Testament. It's usually used to describe how we are reproached or how we are rebuked by those that are in the world. So usually the application is the world rebuking us or the world reproaching us. This is the only occasion where this particular Greek word describes Jesus rebuking his disciples. And there really is something here for us to pay attention to. That is unbelief. And hard hearts. Because I think that that's probably two areas that are critical for all believers. And two areas where a lot of believers, perhaps the majority of believers, stumble and get tripped up. Why would he rebuke their unbelief and hardness of heart? For the same reason I just said. It's an area that we get tripped up in way all too often. How does your heart grow hard? I think one of the major causes that you could lock on to would be disappointment. Think about it. I was thinking about this in terms of, remember the, the story, um, Prisoner in the Third Cell? And the story of John the Baptist and being in prison and hearing all these stories and reports coming back about the work that Jesus is doing and wondering if he is the one to come or if there's another that's going to come after him. And he gets his disciples, John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, and he sends them to Jesus to ask the question, are you the one or is there another one to come? And you remember Jesus' response was, tell John 
that the lame walk. Tell John that the deaf hear. Tell John, you know, and he goes through the whole litany of the things that, that the works that he was doing. You tell John that. And, oh, it's almost as a side thought, by the way, by the way, blessed is he who is not offended in me. And I believe that dovetails in very nicely with the lesson that he's trying to give here at this point. When is he talking about the hard-heartedness that we can find in our own lives? Why do we grow hard-hearted? Because of disappointment. Disappointment in others, being unwilling to trust or risk loving another person brings disappointment, makes a heart grow hard. Jesus You might remember Matthew chapter 19, verse 8, said that the reason that God allowed Moses to make a law concerning divorce was because of what? I granted you divorce for this reason, because of your hard-heartedness. That's the only reason. Because you wouldn't, and you see how serious it is, how deep it goes having its beginning in that area of disappointment. Hard hearts can develop in all kinds of relationships. In fact, they normally or mostly do in those areas. Marriages especially. It is hard hearts that lead to divorce. Disappointment in God. Blessed is he who is not offended by me. Remember we talked about that at that time and You know, you think about all the people that were being healed in that house. And it came to the time that was like 11, 11 11.30, 12 o'clock at night. Hey, got to go home and get some rest. But what about that guy that had been waiting in line for 16 hours? And he was just about ready to be able to be healed or be touched or be prayed for by the Lord. And the Lord says, I got to go. What? What do you mean you got to go? He prayed for all these other guys. Blessed is he that is not offended or not disappointed in me. But it's that disappointment. Hard hearts develop in that way. It's hard hearts that lead to divorce, to separation, to conflict, and disappointment in God. Things not turning out the, the way that you wanted them to or the way that you had hoped. The Israelites wandering in the wilderness had hard hearts. Why? Because they'd run out of water. Moses, remember the groaning and the complaining and we need water, we need water. What would you do, bring us out here to die? They had difficult times. Psalm 95 verse 8 tells us that they developed hard hearts and they complained against God. Psalm 95, 8. They developed hard hearts and complained against God. Notice, developed hard hearts. It's not something that just, oh, I got a hard heart. Where did I, I don't know, just caught a cold, you know. No, they developed. And if you know how they developed them, then you know how to thwart that development, if you would, in your own life. We're going to see that here in a second. But they complained against God. And so for the disciples, they had just gone through the biggest disappointment, as I said earlier, ever, really. They had expected Jesus to become king. They expected Jesus to take over the world. They had been trusting in him. And he had let them down. Blessed is he who is not offended in me. But he had died. Blessed is he who is not offended in me. But he was not able to fulfill what we thought and hoped that he was going to do. Blessed is he who is not offended in me. They had been trusting in him. And to them and to their way of thinking, he had let them down. He had died. And you know what else? It wasn't just that he died. Guess what? It seemed as if he wanted to die. Can you imagine? We had plans. We had vision. We had 
aspiration. Or, uh, is that the right word? That we really wanted to see that happen. That was our desires, our heart's desire. But you acted, Lord, as if you didn't care. But the Lord was about other agendas, right? They weren't on the same page. They said he, he acted as if he wanted to die. In fact, he didn't even resist. He didn't even put up a fight. How would you feel if you had that, that train of thought and you knew in your mind you'd say, uh, this must be what, this is it. You know, we're on the, we're on the right train. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that God wants us to have a soft heart. His new covenant was built around a new soft heart. In Ezekiel 36, verse 26, it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will take that hardness, I'll take that stone, I'll take that dead rock you're lugging around and replace it with a heart of flesh. And when does that happen? When a person is born again. When a person becomes born again. Guys, I, I don't, you know, you hear all the testimonies of people who are just radically changed. And I look at my own life, and I see radical change. I was a different person. A different person. Especially when I got on the football field. But there were so many ways in which I had a hard, stony heart. And when I finally committed and surrendered my whole life to the Lord, He came and He softened my heart. So much so that people would look and, and see things that I would do that they would just shake their head. They couldn't believe it. I can't tell you how many times that somebody would say, man, I thought you were going to rip that guy's head off. But God changed my heart. He gave me a fresh start. And so, number one, that hardness of heart. But the second thing is that issue of unbelief and that issue of faith. Two areas that are very critical for each of us as believers. That's the area of a hard heart and the area of unbelief. Do you know that God wants us to have faith? I don't think, I really don't think God wants you to be gullible and simply believe everything. That's not what I'm talking about. I think it's fine with God that we learn to test all things, don't you? You know, to see what's right and what's not. That we, we ask those important questions. One of the things that bugs me a lot is Christians and, and is how quick we are to, to spread internet rumors, you know. And we're all guilty of it, you know. And it, it's kind of one of those things of, of gullibility, you know. It's like, you know, I, I was listening or reading something the other day and on the internet and, uh, <laughs> and uh, it was... It, it was kind of, it was kind of saying, you know, you got Doctor A's telling you this about that, and you got Doctor B telling you that about this, and it's like, who are you supposed to believe? And so I wish that we would learn to be a little bit more skeptical at times. But the disciples aren't being skeptical in a healthy way here in our text tonight. Their first idea that Jesus had been raised from the dead, should have come when the women first reported that the tomb was empty and that the angel had said that he's risen. But did they do that? No. You're lying, lady. You're lying, girl. As they came and gave him the news. The second idea should have come when Peter and John confirmed, hey guys, the tomb is empty. And the third idea should have come when Mary came back the second time and said she had actually seen Jesus. And now this fourth witness has come when these two guys come back from Emmaus reporting that they had been walking with, and talking with Jesus and listening to him. You see, that goes beyond healthy skepticism 
and it enters into unbelief. And that's why the rebuke came, because of the unbelief. So what is faith? I think that sometimes we have this notion that faith is kind of like a, a magical fairy dust that we keep in a little pouch and we carry it with us wherever we go. We think that if we could only have enough of this little fairy dust or this little faith dust, if you would, then all our problems would go away. But is that what the Bible teaches? No. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. In the New Living Testament, it says, what is faith? That same verse. It is the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. It is the evidence of things we cannot yet see. It's counting on something that you don't see. And it's trusting in something that doesn't make sense, isn't it? That doesn't make sense. What are you talking about? Why would I want to do that? It doesn't make sense. Well, that's faith. Faith may indeed make your problems go away. It might just do that. But if it doesn't, faith will help you go through your problems and take you through your problems. And besides all that, God loves it. He likes it tremendously when we have faith. For Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek after him. Without faith. And, and I, I mean, it's, I, I pray that you guys will just grab a hold of this tonight because it's, it's a real problem for us, this thing of unbelief. And it spirals out of control. And it can in our life. But faith, on the other hand, it produces something in us. First of all, it produces works, right? Faith without works is dead. It's what makes a Christian, a believer like you and I, keep on going. The disciples were going to have plenty of difficult times coming up, weren't they, in their lives? They'd be facing an unbelievable amount of persecution. They were going to go through many things that would indicate that they should just quit and give up. Quit and just walk away. Say, I can't do this. But they were going to need to keep on going. They were going to need to keep telling people about Jesus. And that, my friend, was going to require faith. That is, trusting in Jesus despite what their circumstances would tell them despite what was happening to them as they went from town to town or village to village, despite what was happening to them as they were attacked or as they came across just one thing after another that was hindering their ability to carry out what the Lord wanted them to do. It required faith. Hebrews 11 gives us all sorts of examples of what people did through faith, didn't it? Or doesn't it? You look in Hebrews 11... The chapter of faith, verses six through or seven through sixteen about. But in verse seven it says, By faith, Noah, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen. There you go. Can't see it. But he was moved with godly fear. And he prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. According to faith. <clears throat> Noah, Noah had a job. And it wasn't an easy job. You know, people come by and laugh at him every single day of the year. They had never seen a need for what he was building. But even if he had a boat, the nearest body of water was by far and a far away, away place. Noah's faith, it didn't make the flood disappear, did it? But it did make him get up and build a boat. 
and his boat rescued his entire family. Yet he built the boat without ever having seen rain in his entire life. Didn't see that. So what was he doing? He was trusting in what he didn't see. He trusted in what God said. But wait, there's more. Verse 8, there in Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Abraham didn't know where the promised land was. He didn't have friends come back from Canaan and say, hey, there's a nice chunk of land for sale out here. You ought to call your real estate agent and look into it. You know, Moses didn't get online and start going through and saying, well, that's a nice place for retirement. That's a place I... No, God just said, you know what, Abraham? Go. Just go. That's That's hard. I remember, you know, <laughs> going down and, and, I mean, it was a big move for me to move from Santa Barbara, the place I grew up in. I lived till I was like, what, 21, 22? And it was hard to go down to Cal Poly, down in Pomona. You know, because that was, that was my, my home. That's where my roots had been for all that time. I'd never experienced, you know, I... Talk to people and say, yeah, I've moved uh, five times and I've moved ten times and you're not being in the same house longer than a year. But I've been in the same house, same place, same environment, same friends, same neighbors, same schools, same everything. And I felt uprooted and placed down in Pomona. You don't know what Pomona's like. Go, go, go down to downtown L.A. Go to Compton or maybe not Watts. But it's pretty harsh. Just go, Joe. And then when he took me and uprooted me out of West Covina in that same area on staff with Pastor Rawl and just love and ministry and he said, Joe, I want you to go to Northern California. I want you to go to Concord. What? What's in Concord? It's not like, what good thing comes out of Concord, you know? But of Moses, or Abraham, it said, I say Moses earlier, it's Abraham. But verse 9 goes on in Hebrews 11, by faith, by faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, <laughs> I love how he adds that. He's just like deader than a doornail. But from that one man were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Guys, they never saw the kingdom established. They never saw descendants as innumerable as the sand. What they lived on is they lived on God's promise. The promises that he gave. <clears throat> Verse 14. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly if they had called to mind 
that country from which they came out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. God was very pleased with these men and women who desired to trust and obey God. Even though they didn't understand and even though their circumstances told them to quit, give it up, go home. But it says God prepared a city. God prepared heaven for these people. And so faith, guys, you see, is part of salvation. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Look what I did. You did nothing. For a person to know God, to find forgiveness for their sins, and to be assured of eternal life in heaven, they have to trust in Jesus. You have to trust that he died for our sins. You have to trust that his death was enough to make the way into heaven for us. And so you're saying, great, I understand. Faith is important. It's vital. How do you build it? How do you make it strong? How do you make it larger? The first way, guys, is through the word of God. Remember Jesus dealing with those two guys that were walking down the road to Emmaus? What did he do? He went to the scriptures. He went to the word of God. And Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. When you get the Bible into your heart, you're going to realize that God is someone that you can count on. But you've got to get it into your heart. <clears throat> you've got to take it in constantly, guys. Just absorb yourself in the Word of God. But it's not just through the Word of God. And that's the thing is, once you get the Bible into your heart, you're going to realize God is someone that you can count on. <clears throat> but it's not just through the Word of God. It's also through obedience, through going, if you would. Every time we take a step of faith and do something that stretches us a little, I believe our faith is stretched as well. Every time that you go someplace or you talk to somebody that you never would talk to if it were only you, but the Spirit of God speaks to your heart and pushes you in that direction. And you find yourself talking to people that you never would have talked to. You're stretched. But not only are you stretched, but it stretches your faith as well. That's why the writer of Hebrews has this clear link between men and women of faith and the things that they did as a result of faith. For many of you, you found that when you take one of those uncomfortable steps of faith, your faith grows, doesn't it? You know, I, I, I can't tell you how many times, even especially with this church, that we took a step of faith. It cost how much? How in the world are we going to do that? You know, it's going to require what? It's going to, we have to do what? Hey, let's take a step of faith. We found God faithful. You know, it might have been stepping and going out on a missionary trip or doing something that you've never done before and you think, I can't do that. But you go and you're stretched and it stretches your faith. As you step out, as you talk with or pray with a friend or as you do maybe even simple things or even larger things. But I got to tell you, God is looking to use those who will trust in him. He's looking for those that will go. He's looking for those that will willingly be stretched for him. Back to Mark 16, verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It was as if Jesus said, I've corrected you. I've reprimanded you. Now I'm going to use you. Now I'm going to use you. I'm not just going to leave you over in the corner reprimanded. <laughs> you just face the corner and don't turn around. Don't look. Don't do. Just, just stay there. God says, no, come on. 
I'm going to use you. Now get going because there's work that needs to be done. Although you've maybe heard a dozen messages on this text with regard to, you know, foreign missions or, you know, people coming in and really trying to perhaps motivate you to go out into the mission field and whatnot. But literally what is being said here is not go into all the world, but rather as you are going throughout the world, preach the gospel to every creature. In other words, the focus is not on where we are to go, but what we are to do. Not necessarily, it doesn't matter where we go, where the Lord takes us. It's what we do. Whether it be across the oceans or across the street. Whether it be around the world or around the neighborhood. Whether it be on foreign soil or on the campus. Whatever we're doing, guys, we are sharing the gospel. I'm convinced that most of us really want to do this. I think you guys want to. We just Oftentimes we just don't know how. When we fail... To not not so much we fail, not so much because of intimidation or or whatever, but I think we, we fail often because of articulation. And, and that is we are not really sure what it means to preach the gospel. What does that mean? You know, how do you do that? Does, does sharing the gospel mean we're talking about the creation account of Genesis or we're sharing with someone the end times in the book of Revelation? Or how about the praise and the worship of Psalms? Is that what we're to expound upon? Working of the Spirit in the book of Acts. We're learning that right now. But it's, it's a legitimate question to ask, what does it actually mean to share the gospel? And Paul answers this question masterfully when he reminds the Corinthian believers of the gospel that he shared with them. And he said this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Verses 3 and 4. He said, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received. I just gave what I received. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Twice, according to to the scriptures. What did he do? And what's the gospel? Christ died. He was buried. He rose again. The gospel is comprised of three simple but very powerful components. And those elements is what we tried to introduce in our study last week. These three things, guys, the first component of the gospel is that Jesus Christ died for your sin. And you have the opportunity to tell people that their sins are forgiven regardless of what it is that they've done. You can start that conversation. Hey, did you know that your sins are forgiven? You know, Jesus Christ died for your sins. Every sin, past, present, and future. What a relief. What a relief that is from the guilt. Regardless of what they've done, what they're doing or what they will ever do, their sin is forgiven because Jesus Christ was nailed to the wooden beam of the cross at Calvary where he bled profusely to pay the price for every sin. You don't need to convince people they're sinners. You don't need to do that. They they may tell you, I've never sinned, I don't sin. They're lying. And if they want to stick with that story, then you let them stick with that story. And the next time you ask them, how's that sin thing working out with you? Are you ready to talk about it? But they already know it. According to scientists, the male moth, the <laughs> male moths flutter around candles because they think that the wax smells like female moths. A confusion that usually is fatal. But that's what we do. We flutter around things that look hot, that smell good, only to get burned time and time again. And so I get to start up conversations at the gas pump and say, you know, you look like you're feeling a little guilty. But guess what? You're forgiven. You are forgiven. 
A couple thousand years ago, God sent his son to become a man and die in your place. So you're free. Only one sin is unforgivable, and that is if you're, you're failing or you fail to accept what he did for you to death. But every other sin is already forgiven. That's good news. First element, second component or element of the gospel is that Jesus Christ was buried. Peter tells us that during the time Jesus was buried, he went to where? He went to hell, didn't he? And he preached to the worst of the demons, telling them that they no longer had authority over man because their toehold on sin had been obliterated by his blood. 1 Peter 3, verse 18 through 20. And so therefore, although Satan and his demons can try to intimidate us verbally, they are powerless in reality. So component number one, Jesus Christ. Stick with me now, guys. Jesus died for your sin. Component number two, Jesus was buried. Component number three and the final one, he rose again. Something no other guru, something that no other holy man, no other exalted teacher, no other revered leader ever did before or ever has done since. Thereby substantiating and validating the work of Christ on the cross. In chapter 1 of Mark, after Jesus healed a man of leprosy, he said, hey, don't tell anybody. He said, tell no man. But what did the leper do? Yeah, he published it much, Mark 1.45 says. He told everybody. Here at the end of Mark's gospel, Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone. But what do we do? We don't tell anyone. Why? I believe it's because we forget the beauty, the simplicity, and the wonder of the gospel. This thing that's referred to as the Great Commission. Matthew gives us a little bit fuller rendering of it. If you want to look in Matthew 28, verse 18, you can follow along with me. But he says, And Jesus came and spoke to them and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This great commission, it started with the disciples. This was our Lord's parting instructions to them. Hey guys, this is what I want you to do. I want you to preach the gospel to the whole world. But it wasn't just about preaching the gospel. It wasn't just about driving around in a truck with a loudspeaker and reading Bible verses, uh, God so loved the world, you know, and doing the whole thing. It was about making disciples. A disciple is a learner, a follower. The 12 were disciples and they weren't supposed to be the last disciples, just the first ones. But a disciple is one who observes all things that he, Jesus, has commanded. And that includes the Great Commission, which means that more people become involved in God's purpose to reach the world. Paul wrote to Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses... Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. It's to be passed on. It's to be passed forward. For our church here at Calvary Concord, I see the purpose contained really in three statements. Winning the lost, equipping the saints, sending the servants. Winning the lost. God loves this world that we live in, guys. Jesus was the friend of sinners and God wants us to have the same kind of heart that he does, to reach a lost world for him. There are plenty of people to talk to, guys, in this valley even. Now, so for some, that's not such a fun thing to do. Some of us might be a little bit more introverted than others. Some of us have a hard time talking to strangers. Some have struggles with knowing what to say and how to act around an unbeliever, really. But whether we are a person who is gifted as an evangelist 
or a person who struggles, struggles mightily with evangelism, the overall purpose of the church is the same. It remains the same, and that is to win lost people. You may not do it like a Greg Laurie or a Billy Graham, but you may have your own way of doing it. And that is the way that God has instilled in you. But it's certainly what he wants you to do. It's certainly what he wants you to be about doing. Some might be better on the front lines. And we need to support in any way that we can. Others may not be that great at witnessing. But that doesn't mean that you can't be helping to move the church in the right direction. We need that. And that doesn't mean that we can't be nice people out in the world. That we can go out and talk. Like I said, that gas pump's a great place to talk to people. It doesn't mean that we can't learn to be a better friend or to be, you know, maybe that person at work or wherever it might be. That maybe one day you get that opportunity to invite them to church or to be the one the person that they can talk to about maybe a problem they're going through. Evangelism doesn't always have to be, you know, talking to strangers and debating the issues. I think a lot might happen if we just simply started praying for people that we have a relationship with. The Lord might give us an opportunity to lead them to him. And so, guys, again, number one, winning the loss. Number two, equipping the saints. So once a person comes to the Lord, he's now a saint, if you would. I don't mean that they become perfect, but they become someone who has been forgiven and someone that God wants to do a work in. But in my mind, a saint isn't the end of the line. I don't think God's heart is just to fill up the church with people that say the sinner's prayer and, and that's all there is to it. No. He wants you to be busy about building the kingdom of God. He wants us to grow as Christians. God wants us to learn to follow him. God wants us to be disciples and that requires training. One of the verses that over the years has become very important to me as well as being pivotal in my ministry comes from Ephesians chapter 4. And in verse 11 where it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. He's got jobs for us all. Some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. As a pastor teacher, one of my responsibilities is that equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Ministry is not my job alone. It belongs to each and every one of us. Reaching out to people, people that are sick, comforting those that are hurting, praying for those that are sick. All the things that we are called to do. And part of my job as well as yours is to help others Learn to do the ministry. How do you do that? You call. You, you, you get busy about God's work. The way I look at it, my goal is to take a saint and help him to grow into being a servant. Too often the disciples themselves got caught up in wanting to become important in church. Remember, they, they would fight over that and wrestle over that. They argued who was going to be the top dog, but Jesus would always take the boys aside and let them know that they had it all wrong. If they were really going to grow as Christians, the goal is not to become more important. It's to become a servant. He said in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And then lastly, sending the saints out. That last step for the health of the church God doesn't want to fill the church with servants who just come and listen to the pastor tell them how to be a better servant. God wants a church made up of servants that will go and, and be his representative in a dying world. Jesus told the disciples, go into all the world. So we need to go to, for some of us, it might be just going to across the street, like I said, you know, going to the school to work or being that person that, you know, I, I'm amazed. You know, I was having a conversation uh, with Melissa and she was 
telling me about some of the people that uh, she has come into contact with at her work and just how much they don't know about church. Literally don't know. And they got into a conversation about tithing. It just blew their mind. You did what? You do what? 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 Are you crazy? They just don't know. They don't know. And they won't know unless we go. You know, and, and just love on them. And, and be that light that they can see what the Lord is all about. For others, guys, it's maybe going the missions field or whatever it might be. Only God knows where he wants to take you. But that is the cycle. Winning. Training. Sending. Where are you today? In that place where you need to take that first step of trusting God. And I, I, I love this. Because almost so much of it has to do with trusting him, doesn't it? Especially in the difficult things. The things that we look at our life and it just says, can things get any worse? I felt like that the other night. I had gone to anoint Billy with oil and pray for him. And for some reason I took it and I put the cap back on and I put it in my shirt pocket. And and, and these are like shirts that I got for Father's Day. It was like eight shirts, seven or eight shirts. And so I put them and God was going to wash them for me and put them in the washing machine and I don't know how because I tighten that thing but that bottle of anointing oil about that big about that big around it came open and I just went oh really I mean you know at those times when you're just like what can go wrong will and you're just like Lord and I just was like oh but the Lord later on told me, he says, Joe, trust me. Trust your wife. No. <laughs> trust me. And I, and I, you know, through that, I mean, immediately I saw just the lesson that he was teaching me. But she was able to get some stuff that she squirted on it, washed them again, took out like the first time, like 90 to 95% of what was in there. And she's going to do it one more time, so don't worry about that. What I'm saying is, Guys, we need to trust him, don't we? It may seem out of control. It may seem like there's no answer. But God is faithful. And you need to walk in faith. And you need to trust him. And we need to really work at it. Because it's not easy. Amen. So Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, to walk by faith. Lord, as we study and, and look at the examples that you give to us, you know, of these guys that things didn't work out the way that they had hoped that they would. And in fact, it was really all upside down and out of whack. But Lord, you know that. And Lord, you know when that's going to happen in our life. And I just pray for each one of us tonight here and those that are listening in. That Father, we would become those who trust in you when we don't see it a clear path, when we don't see a clear answer. That, Lord, we might just trust that, Lord, you will accomplish your purpose and your plan in our life. That, Lord, we'll be stretched along the path, along the way. And along with that, our faith will be stretched. But that's okay. Because that brings great fruit. Father, we love you. We thank you for tonight. We ask God again that you just continue to draw us closer to you. But, Lord, we ask it now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you guys. Good night. And I hope to see you Sunday. Remember, we're going to be here face-to-face -face physically. So we encourage you guys to come and take advantage of that.
God bless you.